A world is under attack at this very moment. I'm John Everett, a.k.a. Alien John. Um, where I'm from is a very time-dependent uh, question. Uh, grew up in Maine. The first spinning prop I got into was actually flower sticks in like, oh geez, like 94, 95. There's just something about the dynamicness of it uh, that drew me in and it became apparent that it was challenging, but that like if I stuck with it, uh, I could keep discovering new things and, and I could tangibly see myself improve. So I moved out to Boulder, Colorado uh, and hooked up with a bunch of uh, new friends there that were into the rave scene. So I think literally the first rave I went to, I had brought the flower sticks and was playing with those a little bit. And this uh, freehand glow stick kid came up and was like, wow, that's really cool. And so he was letting me try his glow sticks and I was just letting my body do whatever it came up with based on flower stick muscle memory. This freehand glow sticker was like really excited because he was like, wow, man, these are that's like really unique moves. We, like I haven't thought of that before. So that really planted the seed, I think, uh, for like my prop cross pollination. Um, and just for those, those years I was getting into glow stringing, then starting to realize that was also relating to this poi thing, you know, just sort of a slower, similar thing. When I was getting into this stuff, it was a bit ahead of the curve where there wasn't a huge community. We weren't like super well connected online yet. There wasn't streaming video yet. So it was just like me exploring and meeting a few kids at raves and like juggling in the park. So just all of a sudden I kind of like got connected with uh, several people who are actually like out there vending and teaching different skill toys is kind of what we were thinking of it at the time. I went out to Minnesota to Harvest Fest is a Wookiee Foot music festival that they put on and by the end of it, Mr. Fun, who owns uh, Mystic Toys, was like, man, you're really into this poi thing. Like, hey, you know, so I'm like, I've been this stuff at festivals and I've been trying to get into this whole Renfest thing. You want to go down there and like work a poi booth for me? And I was like, what? Wait, really? I can like get hired to spin poi and sell poi? Went to this Renfest selling poi. That was actually kind of a shit show. Uh, the booth was not that well organized, but in doing so, I hooked up with like the Sphere Play crew and Crystal Six selling flower sticks. Um, and just all of a sudden, like all these different vendors are like offering me to come and like uh, work at their booths. And so from 2004 on, I just kind of ran away with the Renfest circuit, went back, like got rid of anything I couldn't put in a suitcase moved out of my apartment, living out of a tent like full on for several years. You know, I had like a hard two day work week on the weekend teaching and selling what I loved. And then I had like a four or five day weekend during the normal week where I was just spinning poi and other props like six, eight hours a day. Well, you know, so what was it? 2004, I think Andy House on Home of Poi dropped his idea about kind of classical hybrids, which are just like isolation versus extension. So Olive had been posting a bunch on Home of Poi and, and Tribe about thinking of hybrids as different driving styles. Right, it just seemed asymmetric to me that in spin, quote unquote, direction, um, you could do these classic hybrids in, in one rotation, one beat. There weren't the anti-spin uh, equivalent. I, I managed to get uh, an old HP laptop loaded 3D Studio Max back, back up on it. With Studio Max, if you've parameterized how you're gonna get some things spinning like a spirograph or whatever, now you can just twiddle variables and all of a sudden blast out like, you know, 16 different variations like that. Um, and that's when it really sort of clicked and I was like, well, okay, what, what would it look like if I take a hybrid and just reverse the direction of this thing all one beat? And I'm like, whoa, that's weird. Can I actually do that? Before that, since I'd been lurking on like Homopoi or whatever, when I first 
kind of came out of the RenFest bubble and started getting on forums again, got on Tribe and actually started posting, answering people's questions, popping ideas out there. At first people were like, who the heck is this guy? What the heck are you talking about? And then I think it was Lucas was like, oh, whoa, wait, actually, wait a second, guys. Like, he's on to something. I think there was a little bit of mystique early on because I was like so like hippie in it, living out of a tent. I didn't have access to a camera. This was before smartphones. I think the first videos of me were from, uh, what was it, Wildfire 2007, like some fire spinning. So there, there, there's sort of like this this funny like alien sighting thing for a while where like I wasn't taking my own videos, but people would catch me at a festival or something and slowly but surely like actual video proof was coming out <laughs> that I was, I was spitting some crazy tech shit. After the, I'd been doing the RenFest thing for a while, I got together with my friend Adam Diaper and we put together a little circus show, started touring that around during a summer. Inadvertently, we ran into Zan and Noah uh, when they were doing their Instruments of the Now tour at the same time, kind of hit it off. So, uh, yeah, like, Zan showed up at some point or another down in Arizona uh, and was like, man, we should, like, make a video together. So that's that's how uh, the Poi transmission video came about. For its time, that was like a really groundbreaking video where we were doing a bunch of new crazy stuff, laying uh, some shots of the computer generated stuff over it and, and coming back to us spinning. You know, we continued as we were both touring to cross paths and eventually was like, hey man, I'm thinking of making a second encyclopedia. Do you want to you want to make Encyclopedia 2 with me? Zan, conceptually in Zan's mind at first, he's like, okay, yeah, so I think we just want to throw a few of the animations in here. So here's my shot list. I just want you to kind of like, let's just make an animation that goes in there with this pattern. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, man, yeah, I could do all that sort of one-off work just to do a few scenes, but I'm like, but I, I've really already parameterized all like how you do these flowers and, and unit circle stuff, and I can just twiddle the parameters and spit out every freaking pattern we want. Um, so instead, I just <laughs> scripted some stuff up to like output all these different pattern loops and folder structured and named them as such, and was just like, here's in, we can just make whatever we want. He was like, yes. <laughs> Okay, that's what's up. I look back at it now and I'm like, oh man, like the production value is kind of silly and we looked all silly. We're dressed up in like our shabby clothes and man, I really refined my, my models for things to even, I think, more more accurate and effective for how I explained Poi since then. But, uh, I, you know, I guess for its time, that was a really uh, big step. I did get to the point where it was feeling like I was quite a repository, not just like an encyclopedia of tricks, but also like really trying to dig into uh, modeling how to parameterize and think about what we were doing and how we could adjust that to find blind spots. Th there was a little bit of like getting to know my ego uh, and how to be healthy with that. Like I don't actually really want to be the center of attention, but it felt good at a certain point to really have so many people enthusiastic about what I was doing. I really came to the the conclusion that like every possible movement pattern and expression that you can put out there is like it's kind of already been done but not quite with the flavor you're going to bring to it. It's the potential is out there just because of the physics of the human body and some props. Um, so I really decided to start thinking of it less that like, oh, well, I came up with that move and more like, okay, well, I discovered it this way. I think it's more about discovering and uncovering like your version of that thing. And you might be a trailblazer and you might have pulled some stuff out that no one else or only a few other people had glimpsed. Um, but it, like, it's there for everybody to find. I was, I was touring enough where I wasn't doing as much RenFest anymore. Um, and I was slowly just starting to build a little bit of a following where I was able to teach some workshops. And I went to my first fire drums and that was like a pivotal moment. But I met Nick Haming down from LA uh, area and Burning Dan and Tea Fairy. It was fun meeting all these different spinners and geeking out on tech poi stuff kind of early in its evolution. Um, but me and Dan and Tea Fairy uh, and Nick, we really like hit it off. That next day I was like, hmm, maybe I should just go to LA. <laughs> and I was like, hey Dan and T Ferry, can I come hang with you in LA? Uh, and they were like, yeah, you can come live with us. I mean, I was kind of there in the room with them when they made a conscious decision to really 
put the name flow arts out there. It's not any one person who like, you know, coined that term exactly. I mean, Flow Toys had been sort of using it. Issa Glitter Girl had been using it. I'm sure other people had, but like straight up Dan and T-Fairy were like, no, for real, we, we like, we are going to make a concerted effort to call it this because we don't, we don't want it to be all about performance or like being a sexy fire spinner. It's about the the inner experience as well as performance and, and finding your flow state. So I kind of made the conscious choice to shift into making and selling tangible props as my living rather than just trying to tour and teach. I was, I was basically interviewing for an internship at Okta and Brian Pinkham happened to be there. Brian is of course always looking at whatever like RGB light tech is out there and so he'd come across these they were like really janky RGB LED flashlights from a Chinese vendor so it was doing very slow pulse width modulation which is how you control the colors of the flashlight because it was so slow as soon as you weren't holding it still and you start moving it around you're getting all these like color blinking artifacts he had the brilliant idea to like stick some fiber optics on there was a total like bug is a feature move um, he was taking this like this flashlight whose ref that the, the refresh rate was crappy and exploiting that and it looked amazing. So he was like, yeah, man, I'm just like making these out of like my friend's garage and like I could use some help making them. You want to like, I'll pay you to help me assemble them. Like it's, you know, straight up like hand assembly in a garage type thing. Uh, so I started working with Brian on that just to make some extra bucks. Then I started talking to him about like online sales and some marketing stuff and things I vaguely picked up and just sort of one thing led to another, and uh, I started helping him out with more and more stuff, and then he was like, man, you, okay, you actually really know what's up. Um, if you help me get these things mass produced instead of us making them by hand, like in China, um, let's go 50-50, like you can buy in with sweat, sweat equity, we'll start a company together. Uh, I introduced Brian to um, Sean and Prisna, we moved into the Flow Space 1.0, uh, and they basically incubated us early on with Fiberflies. Sean and Prisna and Flowtoys have been very good mentors, both in learning what I should do and what I personally should not do, because I am not as organized as Prisna, and I don't want to manage an entire warehouse myself. <laughs> I'd sold props, managed booths for people, sort of saw the, seen the other people vending at festivals, I'd hung out with Sean and Prisna, seen how Flowtoys grew, so when... Uh, Fiberflies showed up before it was called Fiberflies. Uh, that's that's sort of why I was like, okay, I actually really do need to take this seriously and shift focus. As it turns out, when you start a business from scratch and grow it into international sales, uh, it's kind of more than a full-time job. And Poi was already Poi teaching was already at least a full-time job for me. Uh, but so it goes. It's nice to like be able to let go of that role and be gratified by people building off of what, what I contributed, um, as opposed to like trying to cling cling to that. Things evolve, and, and uh, whereas I just sort of started out as this guy like helping Brian out, and he was like, yeah, maybe we could do this thing. Um, I guess just because of the experience I've had and who I knew, uh, I saw how far it could go, and just kept taking it there and learning what it took to take it there. And if you're trying to start your own venture of some sort, um, even if you're kind of feeling casual and uncertain about it at first, try to think big, like begin with the end in mind. Even if you can't imagine you're gonna become this total successful business or poi teacher, whatever the heck you're, you're kind of dabbling in, like try to take a moment and envision like what it could really become and then just let that drive you to learn about what it takes to go there. You know, I'm a props to try to make a prop that I would want to play with. There's a whole bunch of people that are maybe intimidated by like what it takes to learn how to juggle or contact juggle or even spin poi, but they're comfortable picking up this thing and wiggling it around and dancing and having a fun time and it looks cool and other people think it looks cool and so they get a taste for that that's okay to be in, yet like we've immediately been seeding them with like, oh look, you can do rope dart, dart techniques and poi techniques and these like body tracing things like liquid dance and, and uh, that's how I've always viewed uh, fiber whipping. So whether or not people know it when they first get into it, it's utterly priming them to find the rest of the flow arts community and see where they can go with that. Be, be willing to follow your own personal path while uh, seeking out how you can learn and co-create with a bunch of other people out there. And I think that's how 
the whole floor art scene has come as far as it has and developed so broadly. Hey friends, so this is an interview that really meant a lot to me. Uh, not only because Alien John was that guy that inspired me when I got into Tech Poi, um, but also because he has been unbelievably generous with his time for the entire time I've known him. You were <laughs> one of the first people to share my videos back when I wasn't even sharing my videos. And uh, <laughs> also just, you know, the hours that we spent talking online about different toy tricks and everything. So I just wanted to thank you thank for you. <laughs> making yourself available for this. This is the longest Profiles in Poi interview I've ever done. So if you want to check out the full uncut version of this, you can find that on my Patreon at patreon.com slash drexfactor. And, uh, and including visit... the ice truck, yeah, ice cream truck Easter egg. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, you'll, you'll have a good time watching that. Uh, you can find Fiberflies online at yeah, uh, it's buyfiberflies.com. So b u y f i b e r f l i e s dot com, and Facebook Fiberflies, uh, Instagram by Fiberflies, YouTube Fiberflies, Google us, you'll find us, and uh, yeah, check out check out our. Uh, our new snazzy or <laughs> one of the newer novel uh, glowing flow props out there. Yeah. Uh, please support artists who are starting good businesses. And John is both a great artist and a great business person. So check all that out. Yeah. Thanks for watching, everybody.